Good Friday to you, and thank you for your presence with us on this day and throughout the week as we have remembered the passion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I invite you now to listen to the words of a call to worship that come to us in the form of a poem. These are poems that we've been reading throughout the week from a book entitled, We Sang a Dirge by Lo Alman. In this poem, he describes his prayer and his struggle with the Lord. The first night I ever prayed to God, my eyes were shut tight. My fists were clenched even tighter, ready to turn my bedroom into a boxing ring, to bob and to weave, away from any attempts at harming me. But he met me with an open heart, with his hands outstretched, told me that he wasn't afraid of the fight I would bring, told me that I can place the sharp ends of my brokenness in the proof of his already pierced palms. I was not ready to give in. I swung my fists like clenched flower buds, blowing in the breeze. But God was patient and still is. Springtime emanating from his optimism believes that I will bloom one day into a field of unimaginable color. I pray it so. I pray it so. Today, we add a fifth cup, a cup that is reserved and set aside. We aren't allowed to drink it. Therefore, there is no blessing over this fifth cup. We only see it. We do not touch it. We do not drink from it. We just pass by it and accept that it is for someone else. In the garden, Jesus prayed, Father, is there a way for this cup to pass by me? Yet not my will, but yours be done. Let us pray. On this most holy and somber of days, we are confronted with our humanness. Not just sins from a list of do's and do nots. We are confronted with our human nature that never asks the question of what the cost is of leaving your will. We just do it. But he did not. There on his knees he prayed. And now we come alongside him in repentance of our sins. That as you hear our prayer in this moment of silence, our wills become less and your will be done through us. O oh God, have mercy on us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So our hymn for today is actually a, a very powerful hymn that we often sing on Good Friday. It's called, What Wondrous love is this. And this hymn is a, a, a reminder 
of the events that took place on Good Friday and what amazing love our God has for us. But it's also a hymn of hope. And it comes to me particularly this year because it's a hope of singing on eternally because of those we've lost and those that have gone before us. Him, the verse 4 says, And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing and joyful be. And through eternity, I'll sing on. I know that those that have gone before us, are up there in heaven singing this hope with us. So just a few instructions as we get ready to praise the Lord with this amazing hymn. Those that are here in this space, uh, we can hum the tune as we see the words on the screen. Please hum as loud as you can because it is an amazing hymn as you see the words. Those at home, please sing out. Sing this amazing hymn with all your voice. And I just want to invite everyone now to stand and sing and hum with me.
You may be seated. Once again, our entire series titled The Fifth Cup has come from Exodus chapter 6, beginning with verses, uh, verse 6 and running through verse 9. Today, I invite you to pay a special attention to, to verse 9. I am God. I will bring you out from under the cruel, hard labor of Egypt. I will rescue you from slavery. I will redeem you, intervening with great acts of judgment. I'll take you as my own people, and I'll be God to you. You'll know that I am God, your God, who brings you out from under the cruel, hard labor of Egypt. I'll bring you into the land that I promised to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and give it to you as your own country. I am God. Then verse 9. But when Moses delivered this message to the Israelites, they didn't even hear him. They were that beaten down in spirit by the harsh slave conditions. My friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hello. This morning, this afternoon, slash evening, all times, wherever you're watching this, the reading from the New Testament comes from selected verses from John chapter 18 and 19. However, I would really encourage you to read both of these chapters today at some point by yourself or with your family. Friends, hear the word of the Lord. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was about to happen, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that had, he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. Now Simon Peter, he was standing and he was warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? Well, he denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose, Peter, whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Well, again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a cock crowed. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in purple cloth. They, they kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And striking him in the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. And so Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. 
Pilate said to them, here's the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was on the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. Again, they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. And Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. My name is Andrew, and I'm really excited to be here with you. This experience this Holy Week has been one of, ah, wonderful, because I feel like I've been isolated for a year. And now I get to come to worship with you and our, some, some folks from Portlock where I serve. I'm so grateful to be, get to come, and I get to be with my colleagues and friends in ministry, and it's, it's really cool. I have a, the fifth cup to bring to you today. And to be honest, I don't have a chalice, but this one was at my church because of one of the pastors before me named Bob Robinson, who is still in ministry at Messiah United Methodist Church in Chesapeake. And... Bob has been a great mentor to me here at Portlock in my time. And this cup reminds me not only of Bob, but all of the people in my life who God have placed at a crux of often a, a time of crisis or time of great confusion to, to bear and carry me through. And so this cup, for me, represents that that I bring for us today. Friends, let's pray. Holy God, your spirit is present. People of God, can you sense the presence of God? We open to you today, tonight, God. We long, we yearn after a week of journeying with you in this passion today. We bring our full selves to you as much as we can. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts collectively bring you glory and you alone, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to you be the glory. And all God's people said, amen. The fire is warm. It's a cold night. The air this evening has a bite to it, kind of like it does right now outside. The burning coals are welcome to your cold hands on this, this evening late in the winter season. The Jewish community has come from all around to celebrate this week here at the temple with their Passover rituals. But celebration tonight is not what is in the air. There is a cold atmosphere thick with deception and violence and vengeance. They have finally got him. The crazy Jewish rabbi who was claiming to be the son of God was arrested in the garden near the temple not long ago. Across from you stands a familiar face. You know you've seen that face somewhere. Aren't you one of the followers of that rabbi, Jesus from Nazareth? No, 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 you must be mistaken. That is not me. But I could have sworn, no, 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 it's, it's not me. You have me confused with someone else. Well, there was this rumor that one of the Roman officers had his ear chopped off. I mean, whoever did that must have had to be pretty skilled. You don't just, like, miss on the face and get the ear. You got to know what you're doing with a sword to get the ear. 
so these guys must be some kind of like violent militia to kind of go get the temple or something. No, 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 it, it, it's not like that. So you were there. No, no, it wasn't me. That's just what I've heard. Somewhere in, in the distance, a rooster crows, strange for this time of the evening. The faces of those gathered around these blazing charcoals are illuminated with oranges and reds and yellows. This charcoal fire. This detail placed here in the scripture intentionally and powerfully, but so subtle, rush over it, you'd miss it. The depths of scripture, line by line, waiting to be explored to empower and equip you. This charcoal fire makes me think of Elijah running down fire in absolute faith against the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings. It makes me think of the coal placed on the tongue of Isaiah in Isaiah 6, after which his guilt departed from him, even though he was a man of unclean lips. Could Peter be a man of unclean lips too? It makes me think of the, psalm, the, the palm ash that we received some 40 days ago at the beginning of this Lenten season, this crazy year we've had. Our mortality is reminded to us by this ash. But this fire at which Peter denies Jesus is the fire that will appear in the coming weeks, the fire of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes the months after this painful night. Peter's unfaithfulness, which will stop, not stop the love of God, but will be used as a purifying agent and fire for Peter's greater calling. These coals warming the hands of someone ashamed of their connection to Jesus and denial prophesied. But also the same one who will be called what? The rock upon which the church of God will be built. My friends, what is the current condition of your discipleship with Jesus this Good Friday? This day stings with pain and suffering. We can choose to avoid that and deny it. We can choose to medicate ourselves, not to feel the sorrow and the pain with busyness, with work, with people, whatever our drug of choice may be, or we can be still. We're gathered here. We've taken a time out today from the business, busyness of our life and feel what is here. The words of Glennon Doyle are ringing in my ears today as I think upon the messiness of Peter and the messiness of Andrew. Be messy, be complicated, be afraid, and show up anyway. Here we are. It may feel like sorrow and suffering today or for another day, but there will come a third day. And we will never be left alone to face our darkest fears by ourselves. When you walk through the fire, I'll be there. Pastor Sarah reminded us a couple days ago. We may just be moving through the shifting sand in our failure, our denial, our shame of following Christ that is being built into something that's transformingly beautiful because sand turns into a rock eventually. Now you're in a crowd. There's a mob forming. You see this Jesus in the temple courts. People yell, scream, crucify, away with him. They don't just want imprisonment or punishment. They want death. Death in its most humiliating most violent, grotesque, inhumane way possible. The governor pulls out this purple cloth. Purple garments are not easy to come by in the ancient world. You don't just go to Joanne's or Michael's, or in this case, Archangel Michael's, or Joanna's, or Lydia's. Thought maybe I get a laugh on Good Friday, but no, there it is. Purple dyed garments are painstakingly perfected 
by the Phoenicians around 300 years before Christ. It involves removing the glands of deep water shellfish and letting them putrefy in the sun for numbers of days. Sounds delicious. Resulting in these rich, deep colors of reds and blues, which then can be formed into purple. Making purple fabric in the ancient world very desirable and expensive. And also quite stinky. The Romans purchased large amounts of this fabric, monopolizing the color to symbolize Roman imperial authority and status. The governor here, Pilate, places this expensive imperial color to symbolize the mockery of Jesus as he's flogged and called the king of the Jews. These purple dyed garments intermingled with his beaten flesh. The liquid pouring from his body, mixed of deep red and rich purple, made more fluid with human sweat and tears. The smell of putrefied fish, the smell of blood and sweat, the sound of screams in the temple courts this day. Well, then he didn't stop there. He pulled out a crown of thorns and shoved it on his head. Two inch thorns placed on the skull of Jesus. John's gospel, brothers and sisters, makes clear that Jesus was a political enemy of the Roman state. By flogging Jesus, dressing him in purple, and putting a crown of thorns on his head, and repeatedly presenting him to the Jewish authorities as your king, Pilate, and the whole Roman occupation was mocking Jesus. Jesus is presented in John's gospel as one accused of challenging the Roman emperor by calling him, by claiming to be king. Well, the Roman soldiers mock Jesus, calling him king of the Jews. The Jewish leaders reject Jesus' kingship because, as it says, of their allegiance to the emperor. We have no king but the emperor. While much of Christian theology claims Jesus died for humanity's sins, and he did, John also makes it clear that Jesus was killed for political reasons too. The Jews didn't kill Jesus. The Roman occupation and its Nazi-esque thirst for control and total allegiance and suppression and oppression of anyone who would not The Roman genocide murder machine killed Jesus. Remember our Exodus reading we've been hearing all week that Pastor Tim just read? The Jewish community knew all too well what this kind of Roman occupation was capable of. Even though it had been some 400 years, this kind of slavery and oppression is not cleansed easily from the imagination that they had come from in Egypt. They saw what a similar regime regime was capable of doing, right? The violence, the dehumanization, the thirst for complete and total dominance and power. They could see where this was going. Remember all the incredible songs we've heard this week and we've sung and all the wonderful liturgies and poems we've meditated on and all of the awesome reflections that my colleagues and friends have, have brought forth We know where all this is going too. The patterns repeat themselves, don't they? The human heart is a vicious and never satisfied animal. It will stop at nothing to get what it wants and when it wants it. We will worship idols and we will create golden statues The spirit of the Egyptian and Roman occupation lives in us if we feed it enough. Political ideologies and political parties become our saviors, shoving our Christ off the throne and back on the cross. 
We will use anyone we perceive as weaker than us to maintain this place. We'll colonize lands and peoples thinking we are in God's will. We will commodify the soil and mock the very creation we were birthed from. As long as the stock market keeps churning and commodities keep getting cheaper and we can stay numb to what reality leaks beneath the surface of our medicated heart. The patterns keep repeating themselves. The engine keeps spinning. Our God is not only mocked, our God is dead. Jesus is gone. The end. The system wins. We will never escape this oppressive system of death. The pattern of selfishness and mockery will be ours forever. Again and again and again. We have crucified the only hope we had at disrupting this system, my brothers and sisters. Liberation and salvation are gone. But then, we go back to the garden. The story begins in a garden, you remember? There was ear chopping and everything in the garden. Just like The book we're reading from, it begins and it ends in a garden. And this story will end three days from now. Where? In a garden. Another disciple's failure, Judas, leads these people to find and bind Jesus in the garden. And what happens in the garden when they find Jesus? When the system finds Jesus, they say, who is this Jesus of Nazareth? What does Jesus say? I am he. And they fall to their feet. The very presence of God disrupts the system. If only we had something that can show us a way out. If only there was some symbol that can show us what can really disrupt this once and for all, the cure for the human heart. If only there was something we could look to that can show us the answer to salvation and the disruption of this system and this engine that will take whatever it wants. If only there was something that can cure the hole inside of us. Thanks be to God for the cross of Jesus Christ which today we see our Savior hanging upon. Father, to you be the glory. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Andrew, for that powerful word. Our... uh, Special music for today is actually called Jesus Knows by Martin Green. It's a song that I came across actually almost two years ago. And I said, wow, what an amazing song. I can't wait to do that for Good Friday in 2020. Yeah. So... The truth is, is a lot of the choir members that are here actually probably still have that music. And please turn it back in. But anyways. <laughs> but uh, this is a powerful song that reminds us that no matter what we have gone through, no matter what grief we bear, that Jesus knows. He knows. The words, some of the words is, when affliction sears my soul. In sorrow rends my aching heart. In my pain the Lord has taken part. I'm assured that Jesus knows. Jesus knows and feels the weight of every soul borne down with grief. He suffered, died, and rose again. That we would, that we who mourn might find relief. I think when we're really deep in sorrow for whatever, for the sin in our lives, for the loss of loved ones, 
the human condition, no matter what, the world wants to lie to us and say, you are alone. But we are not. Because Jesus knows. Amen.
each of us has this cup in our life. The cup that Jesus drinks on our behalf. You are not alone in the darkest night the world has ever known. Hang in there, God's with us. The glory of the Lord is yet to come. May you go in the peace, the power, the hope of God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit.